Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 29th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the Anchorage Daily News editorial board's latest attempt to set up a kill shot on the PFD. Second, we explain how the legislature has created an issue with the permanent fund and what it can do to avoid it. And third, we explain why, quote, no taxes until spending comes down, close quote, is just another top 20% dodge. And now, let's join Michael. All right, Brad, uh, the weekly top three. <clears throat> the first one is that the ADN editorial board appears to be sensing weakness. It senses weakness in its prey. The Alaska House of Representatives is now in a precarious position. They're about to pounce. The ADN is doing their thing. Give us uh, give us the rundown here. Well, the uh, the this weekend's editorial from uh, the ADN editorial board uh, is, a, is is an interesting one. Uh, they 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 try to leverage the disarray in the House majority uh, into what effectively would be a kill shot uh, on the PFD. They argue that that now that the House has demonstrated reasonableness in the in the in the view of the uh, in the view of the ADM editorial board by agreeing to a 2575 PFD not stretching out the special session uh, trying to uh, trying to leverage uh, gain counter leverage to uh, to get a higher PFD and agreed to the spending that the that the Senate dumped on them now that the House has demonstrated that they're reasonable and even the House leadership, they said even the House leadership is reasonable because even though they opposed the budget and even though they wanted a higher PFD, they didn't stop the session. They didn't stop the bill from going to the floor and they didn't they didn't uh, uh, engage in the dilatory tactics they could have as leadership. Uh, even they are appearing reasonable, according to the ADN. All of that setup really ought to make you very, very concerned. <clears throat> and then and then the last paragraph goes for the kill shot. Uh, it says, let's uh, keep that ball rolling. Governor Dunleavy should call an October special session in Anchorage with a narrow, achievable focus on the sole issue of a spending cap. Um, and earlier in the piece, they described the spending cap that they're talking about is one that rolls the PFD inside the spending cap, similar to uh, uh, the amendment that Will Stapp uh, ran uh, on the spending cap, dissimilar, unsimilar to what Ben Carpenter passed out of Ways and Means, uh, but similar to the to the, uh, the spending cap amendment that Will Stapp voted, uh, pushed in the House Finance Committee that ended in House Finance Committee exploding on the issue uh, and not finishing finishing the issue. Right. The uh, the the ADN says let's let's narrowly focus on uh, the achievable. <laughs> focus on the sole issue of a spending cap with the PFD uh, inside the spending cap. And as I said, that would be the kill shot on the PFD, because what's going on, if you look at, as we talked about time and time earlier on the show, if you look about what's, if you look at what's going on with the budget, traditional revenues over the course of the next decade are declining. Uh, uh, even with the spending cap, spending would be going up. Uh, if you throw the PFD inside the spending cap, what that does, as did Will Stapp's amendment, 
what that does is elevate the spending cap by another billion dollars because you would say, well, you need to save room for the PFD, but it doesn't guarantee the PFD. So right. Ben Carpenter's. It guarantees, it guarantees another billion in spending, but they don't have to spend it on the PFD. I mean, they use the argument, we need to put this under here so we can give you your PFD, but then, oh, now we can take your PFD and you don't get any. Right. So it increases the spending. I mean, Ben Carpenter's objection to it was exactly correct. It increases the spending cap. By, by putting the PFD inside, it increases the spending cap by a billion, but there's no guarantee that it's spent on the PFD. And with declining revenues, uh, traditional revenues, you can see what's happening. The PFD is more and more and more of the PFD until by 2032, the PFD is almost gone. More and more of the PFD is used to uh, is to use to support spending. It's converted over, diverted over to, to spending as opposed to government spending as opposed to being used. Uh, for the PFD. So ADL, it, it, it's going for the kill shot. No mention at all uh, in the in the editorial of as part of this overall fiscal plan that the ADL is pushing uh, of guaranteeing the PFD, uh, uh, putting the PFD in the Constitution, none of that, um, uh, and none of, of alternative revenue, substitute revenues, which would enable you to back out uh, using PFD cuts as taxes in the form of PFD cuts to fund the budget uh, with uh, with alternative revenues, lower impact revenues on middle and lower income Alaska families. None of that. So it's, a, it's the top 20 percent kill shot. Uh, they're, they're, they're trying to what they're trying to do. It, if if the legis if the governor went down this road, what they would be doing is setting up the death of the PFD, the, the kill shot on the PFD um, uh, and and guaranteeing uh, additional government spending uh, conversion of, of the PFD until it's gone uh, to uh, to government spending. It's the top 20% dream case because spending continues to go up, government spending continues to go up, uh, uh, and, and PFD cuts, taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families are used to fund it. There's no mention, no discussion, no consideration of alternative of alternative revenues because after y'all after all you've got the PFD inside the cap you just keep, keep consuming more and more of that right a a a pf a, a, a spending cap even if you keep the PFD outside of the spending cap is 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 not much better uh, because what will happen is if you don't guarantee the PFD is not much better because what will happen is you'll just keep lowering the amount of the PFD that's outside the spending cap diverting more and more of the PFD inside the spending cap uh, to uh, to support government spending. So there's really the a, a spending cap alone, uh, a, sole, a sole spending cap alone uh, is not is not an overall solution, is not a solution that is fair to middle and lower income Alaska families. It just takes the PFD to have a full solution, as we've talked time and time again on the program, to ha have an actual uh, fiscal plan, an actual full solution that's fair to everybody. You need to guarantee the PFD at some level. You need a spending cap to protect against additional spending, and you need alternative revenues to substitute for the gap that's created by uh, uh, by guaranteeing the PFD or the right. cap, gap that's created by government of course, spending. These are, these are all things that are in ways and means that Ben Carpenter's been working on since the beginning of this term. And he's just, I mean, again, getting sandbagged and pushed back. I mean, the spending cap was going through until that last minute amendment by STAP, which created this whole, you know, challenge to begin with. They're working on it, but <clears throat> what's going to happen? I mean, I, who knows? Yeah. And the spending cap, I, I mean, I was a little, I, I was a little troubled in the first place by the spending cap going out on its own, leaving ways and means on its own without, without the other provisions. Because as I say, <clears throat> Even if the PFD is outside the spending cap, without the without the additional provisions of a guarantee for the PFD and alternative revenues, you just you you you're you're it's just the death of the PFD another way. Uh, Steps amendment certainly made it even uh, made it even clearer what was going on. But I just I, I just think it's interesting that the ADN uh, in trying to play on. Uh, this uh, this division that, that surfaced in the House majority in the final days it was always there, but surfaced uh, uh, very publicly in the final days, trying to play on this division, saying, oh, you all are reasonable. You know, you guys who supported the oh, budget, yeah. 
you're reasonable. <laughs> the leader, even the leadership's reasonable because they didn't they didn't use dilatory tactics to you know hold the budget uh, ransom ha hostage while they tried to work out the issues on the PFD. You guys are reasonable too. So let's just let's just take all this reasonableness. Let's all put it in a room. But now let's keep it focused on a single issue. We don't want we don't want you guys going off on a tangent and, and right. being unreasonable. No, yeah, no full fiscal plan. Only the one thing we want you to talk about. <laughs> you know, you you talk about from time to time, um, and and I and I would as well that you know the PFD. Let's do the PFD first. And some people say some people on the on the left on the progressive side. Let's do revenues first, um, and the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, and the top 20% list, well, let's do a spending cap first because that way down the road, we're protected from ever having taxes on top of PFD cuts and all we lose in all this is the PFD. So everybody's got their got their preferred let's go first uh, uh, item. And, and clearly you can see the top 20%, uh, the Binkley family, <laughs> what the Binkley family is pushing as a, uh, uh, as uh, as their preferred solution, give us a spending cap first, right. and then. Yeah. I mean, it, Michael, there's this is so bad. There's not even there's not even a, a, a whiff of, and then we'll address everything else. <laughs> it is it is. Y'all are so reasonable. Let's just g give me everything I want right now. The top twenty percent. Give give me everything I want right now. And there's not even a. I'll I'll consider your stuff later. It's just give it all to me, and 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 we'll and we'll stop and call it a victory then. Right. That'll be the solution. This is the one hit wonder right here. This is the solution. Uh, Donna uh, <coughs> Hardwin's in the chat room. She says at the current spending rate, the PFD will be gone during Dunleavy's second term at the current spending rate. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm just, you know, we know that it's days are numbered. We know that it's days are numbered based on the current makeup of the legislature and what's going on right now. It's just a it, now it's just a matter of time. You know, was it is it next year? Is it five years from now? We're in the decline. This is where it's going. Well, yeah, I mean, if the if the legislature keeps going down, if the if the House majority keeps fracturing in the way they fractured uh, in the final days this session, if they if they can't get their act together to to hold fast on the PFD going forward, that's probably right. I mean, I, I would I would say that that I think most who voted for the majority voted who who were voting for members who became part of the majority. Most voting for them thought that PFD protection would be at least part of their uh, of their of their mandate, part of what they considered important. Uh, but you know, the ADN is is highlighting the fracture that occurred in the final days and saying, "Well, it looks like <coughs> looks like they don't care about the PFD that much. So let's just go ahead and and get what we want and um, and and we'll call it good." Let's move on to the uh, uh, let's move on to number two. Give me a tease here. And we'll take an early break uh, for number two, uh, which is, uh, of course, the uh, the next big concern for the PFD. Well, there was an article in the uh, in the uh, Alaska Beacon, which I don't think made it to the ADN or the Juno Empire or any of the other papers. Uh, but it's uh, by Andrew Kitchman, and it says the the headline is Alaska Permanent Fund Account that Pays for State Budget Dividends is Under Pressure. And it's uh, talking about an issue that came up was discussed uh, heavily at the most recent uh, permanent fund board meeting down in Kenai Sildatna uh, last week or the, the week before maybe, um, and and focuses on on a developing situation that has raised concerns. I, it, I as as we will talk about, the concern is sort of Bert Stedman made, uh, and we'll talk right. about why that is. But uh, it's a concern that uh, that I think is going to keep surfacing. Uh, in the legislature in the uh, in the coming uh, coming session. What another self-inflicted wound? Say it ain't so. Uh, number two was uh, the next concern for the PFD. Uh, Brad, take it away. Well, for the permanent permanent fund as a whole. So the way the permanent yeah. fund operates, the way the permanent fund operates is the permanent fund corpus generates earnings from from time to time, and hopefully most of the time, those earnings go into the earnings reserve. And then the earnings reserve is used <coughs> both to fund the PFD and to fund uh, uh, the POMB draw uh, that's increasingly being used on to, used to rely on relied on to uh, to fund government spending. the 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 function of that is it depends on 
the permanent fund corpus generating earnings that are then going into the to the to the earnings reserve account to regenerate, to refloat, to rebalance uh, the the draws that are being taken out of the uh, out of the earnings reserve to uh, to go to government. And 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 this year is not a very good year. The earnings are down. Uh, in the past uh, several years, the amount of excess or the amount of of growth in the uh, in the earnings reserve has varied from 3.2 billion dollars in FY17 uh, as much as 7.96 billion dollars in FY21, uh, 4.5 billion dollars in FY22. By comparison, this year is now on track. Uh, to be uh, to come in at about 2.47 or maybe lower. So a significantly lower amount coming into the, the permanent fund earnings reserve uh, from, uh, from, from the permanent fund. That's, that's lower than, uh, than, than the amount needed to, to help regenerate the fund, to help keep uh, the fund afloat uh, going forward. And so the, the concern in the Alaska Beacon is, what if we have two years of this or three years of this or four years of this where you're not getting enough water back into the account? You're not getting enough earnings back into the account uh, to, to have it, to regenerate itself, to have enough to pay the POMB draw uh, and from that to pay the PFD and to pay what's called inflation proofing, which is an amount that goes from the earnings reserve back into the corpus. Right. Uh, inflation proof the corpus. And, and the Alaska Beacon focuses on a concern in the permanent fund corporation itself <coughs> that the earnings aren't going to that the earnings aren't going to be sufficient not only are they not sufficient this year they're not sufficient in future years and 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 you know sort of a discussion about what do we do then if there's a not not enough coming into the uh, into the earnings reserve one of the problems uh, the reason i said this is sort of self inflicted as uh, as as we went to break one of the problems uh, that's ha that, that happens in the earnings reserve is you have these down years, but the earnings reserve historically has kept a bunch of money from prior good years in the earnings reserve as sort of a backstop to, to the down years so that you would still, still have money in the earnings reserve even in the down years. Well, in response to Governor Dunleavy uh, and some of the legislature a few years ago talking about, well, we'll just... We'll, can, we'll, we'll pay the PFD by just taking more out of the earnings reserve. The earnings reserve has these, has these high amounts in it. In response to that discussion, over the last couple of years, uh, Senator Stedman and Senate Finance have led the way into taking excess amounts, uh, more than uh, is required to uh, fund government, uh, fund the PFD, and to, and to pay for the uh, inflation adjustment, to take excess amounts out of the earnings reserve and push it into the uh, push it into the corpus uh, in FY22, for example. Well, in FY20, for example, they took 4.76 billion dollars in excess amounts uh, in, and funded it into the into the corpus. Uh, last year was FY22 was four billion. This year is 4.17 billion. A portion of that, about a billion dollars of that, each of those draws was necessary for inflation proofing, but the remainder of it was just was just an excess amount. So what's happened is by, by, by sort of reacting to what Dunleavy said about let's use the, the, these high earnings that are sitting in the earnings reserve, the reaction to that of moving those excess amounts in or moving what he called excess amounts into the permanent fund corpus where they can't be touched is to drain the earnings reserve down to the point that if it has a couple of bad years, <coughs> then we run the risk of, uh, of not having enough to fund both uh, both the POMB draw, PFD, uh, and the uh, and the inflation proofing. This isn't this isn't really a horrible situation. I mean, we've had these situations in the past. <coughs> Excuse me. And what's happened is they've just deferred the inflation adjustment uh, for one or two or or up to three years, um, and then caught up when there's been a certain when, when the markets have caught up, and when there's been an excess of uh, a high earnings year. Uh, uh, in the permanent fund that's moved over to the earnings reserve, then used those high earnings years to sort of catch up on the on the inflation adjustment. So we've we've had a mechanism in the past that we've used to uh, that, that we've used to address that, uh, but seemingly they want to forget about that mechanism uh, going forward. So it's a combination of both of both the excess draws that Senator Stedman led, uh, moving 
sort of a surplus in the earnings reserve over to the permanent fund corpus and sort of the absence of talking about uh, uh, using uh, uh, deferring on the inflation adjustment uh, as a way to accommodate uh, lows in the earnings reserve. Uh, that's sort of what's leading into uh, leading into this problem. So it's, um, a of, it's a way of artificially creating pressure in the way that they want so that they can say, well, see, now we have this crisis and now we have to deal with it. This is like never let a crisis go to waste. Even crises that we create is what you're saying. Right. And, 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 and the pressure is going to show up in terms of, well, we need to merge the earnings reserve and the permanent fund corpus and then allow a 5% draw uh, on, on that combined amount, which is what we're doing now, but allow a POMB draw on that combined amount plus, plus a, a, a POMB draw on that combined amount, regardless of whether the earnings have been sufficient to fund it. And it's a way, sort of, of setting up a future in which you could draw down the permanent fund corpus. So it's a, it's a it's a it's an artificial crisis, in the sense that it's being created by a simultaneous move of a bunch of money out of the earnings reserve over into the uh, permanent fund corpus excess money that should have been sitting in the in the earnings reserve to sort of get us through the situation, and sort of the failure to contemplate the traditional method we've used in the past of deferring a couple of years of inflation adjustments uh, to, uh, to address, to address the situation, creating, creating a crisis out of that, and then talking about a solution to that crisis that then <coughs> theoretically could open up the permanent fund corpus. In interesting situation. I, I the, the, the pitch uh, in uh, in Kitchenman's article is sort of an, an emerging crisis, and I suspect we'll see others pick up on that and say, "Oh my God, this is a problem. We've got to we've got to deal right. with this problem." Right. But as you as you listen to and as you read articles about that, keep in mind it's artificial, uh, created by the past maneuver of moving excess out of the out of the earnings reserve and the future maneuver of not looking to defer the inflation adjustment. I thought one of the benefits of the POMV was that it was supposed to be automatically inflation proofed. Isn't that, wasn't that supposed one of the arguments that they made originally? Well, it, it's automatically inflation proofed in a different way. Um, it, it's automatically inflation proofed in the sense that you limit the amount of draw uh, uh, from the, the, the permanent fund uh, to the, the after inflation, the post inflation adjusted uh, amount and you and so by that you leave enough you should leave enough in the earnings reserve leave enough in earnings to to be able to cover inflation but you still have to make that move of of the inflation amount out of the earnings reserve over into the uh, over into the corpus to make it work but again they're playing the long game here and this is what we're uh, feeling all right let's move over to number three the latest top 20 percent ploy we got about four minutes brad so <laughs> I've gotten in, in some debates recently with uh, with uh, some friends uh, about uh, about you know this whole fiscal situation, and and basically I've had a, a few situations in which people have responded by saying, "Well, spending's too high, and I'm not going to agree to taxes until spending comes down," <coughs> and 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 use that as a justification for no taxes and and continued reliance on PFD cuts. Here, I, it's a it's a it's a top twenty percent ploy. I mean, basically, we've seen this session spending's not come going to come down. As I said, this session is an inflection point. You have a how you have a majority of Republicans in the House, and yet they voted for a budget that nevertheless continued uh, uh, high spend uh, historically high spending levels uh, and setting up additional programs like K through twelve, uh, child uh, care. Uh, state supported child care, all of which are going to continue to grow uh, the budget in the future. Um, so so we've, we've seen that spending is not going to come down. We're going to be lucky if spending doesn't increase. So it's disingenuous to say, I'm not going to pay taxes until spend, I'm not going to agree to taxes until spending comes down. Spending isn't going to come down. And, and so the choice is going forward, given that traditional revenues are on decline, <coughs> the choice going forward is either PFD cuts or taxes uh, as a way of as a way of, of, of filling the fiscal gap. If you're saying I'm not going to I'm not going to agree to taxes, I'm not going to support taxes until spending comes down. What you're really saying is I'm going to ignore reality. 
spending isn't going to come down. Um, and I'm going to stick on this no taxes pledge. And the, and the consequence of that is going to be continued PFD cuts, deeper and deeper PFD cuts as traditional revenues, revenues continue to decline and spending continues to go up. So when you, when you tell me I'm, I'm never going to, I'm not going to support taxes until spending comes down. What you're really telling me is you support continued deeper and deeper and deeper PFD cuts until, until the PFD has gone. <coughs> and it's, it sounds good. I mean, some of them, I think they say it in, in, uh, in, in good faith, but that's the consequence. The consequence is you're telling me that you're going to support continued PFD cuts, but you don't want to debate the issue. You don't want to debate the fairness of the issue of relying on, <coughs> excuse me, relying on PFD cuts. You want to, you want to say that what you're, that you're, that you're, you know, somehow against taxes because spending's too high. Right. Well, yeah. We're but gonna we're gonna have taxes one way or the other. Not gonna, gonna be PFD cuts yeah, but you're not gonna fix the spending is too high. You're just gonna say, I mean, again, using it as window dressing. I mean, that's the rub, Brad. Right? I mean, out of the one side of their mouth, they're like, until we get the spending down, this is what we can't. But there's no will to cut spending. There's no will. There's no inclination. There's nothing. So it's just a way of again kicking the can down the road while paying lip service to. I mean, they know what the problem is. The problem is the spending. But nobody's willing to embrace that two-fisted, you know, in that regard. And they know what the solution is. They, they know what the solution to the increased spending is going to be additional PFD cuts. <clears throat> so by saying they're not going to support alternative revenue measures, substitute revenue measures, um, uh, uh, while, we continue to, while we continue to have high spending, it's just, I mean, they're just, it's an argument. It's an argument for PFD cuts. I. It is it is disingenuous for Republicans <coughs> like Will Stapp or or Justin Refridge or or the others uh, on that side of the on that side of the majority. It's disingenuous for them to say no taxes um, uh, because we're going to get spending down. They're not going to get spending down. They just voted for a budget that that has increased spending over historic levels and has additional spending built into it. By the passage of, of, of you know the setup for increase in K through 12 and inc a permanent increase in K through 12, a permanent increase in uh, in, in state support of child support, <coughs> not to mention defined benefits coming behind. It's disingenuous to say that we're going to get spending down. That's going to be the solution. Not going to happen, guys. So so here's the choice: how do you fund how do you fund that spending? You're either going to fund it by equitable taxes. Taxes that spread the burden across across all of the state, including the top twenty percent and non-residents, who would pay seven to ten percent of the burden uh, if we went to taxes, or you're going to pay for it by head taxes on middle and lower-income Alaska families in the form of PFD cuts. That's what's happening, one way or the other. And to say you're not going to support taxes, whatever excuse you give, to say you're not going to support taxes means what you're doing, in fact, is supporting PFD cuts. You're supporting you're supporting continued deeper and deeper PFD cuts as traditional revenues decline, which is just so, another form of tax anyway, right? It which is. is. It doesn't fall under their it doesn't fall under their no tax pledge, even though it's the most destructive form of taxation we have. It's not a tax on them. I mean, here's the thing about when the, when the top twenty percent say no taxes, <coughs> what they're really saying is no taxes on me, on the top twenty percent. I don't care that there's head taxes. PFD cuts, the most regressive form of tax ever. I don't require, I don't care, and I'm going to discount and ignore if there's taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families. What no taxes really means in that discussion is no taxes on me. All I'm concerned about is me. And, right. and, I, and I don't want taxes on, on my top 40%. I'm not going to get spending under control, by the way. I don't want taxes on me. So you guys in the middle and lower income Alaska, uh, middle and lower income Alaska families, you just continue paying and paying and paying and paying. Right. Well, and here's Kevin saying the quiet part out loud. I've seen no evidence except on this show that there's political or general right. public will to cut spending. That's it. I mean, that's the, that is the bad news. That's the quiet part that's out loud there. No, there is no will. There is no political except for a handful of legislators. That's it. That's the point. And now the question is, once that's the point, accept your point, Kevin, once that's the point, the next question, and it's, an, and it's as important, if not more important question is, how do you pay for that spending then? 
<coughs> as traditional revenues decline, how do you pay for that spending? And if you don't support taxes, if you don't support taxes, broad-based taxes that hit the top 20% non-resident, if you don't support taxes to pay for that spending, then you're supporting PFD cuts. Taxes on that, that fall hardest on middle and lower income Alaska families, hardest that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. That's the choice. Once you accept that there is no will to cut spending, the question is, how do you fund it? The choices are either taxes, that, broad-based taxes that include the top 20% and non-residents or narrowly based taxes that only hit middle and lower income Alaska families. And, and for legislate, with the legislators who go around and say no taxes, what they're really saying is, I want to keep the taxes focused on middle and lower income Alaska families. I'm not willing to bear a part, in the, part of the burden myself. I want no taxes on me and no taxes on non-residents. Which, of course, is part of the whole problem here. Until there is a will to cut, uh, these are the only solutions. Which, again, the will to cut is not on the horizon. It's just nothing. That we can, again, I've been decrying this for, for 20 years that we need to get the spending under control. When Brad and I first started, Brad first started coming on the program, it was back in 2014, we were calling for, you know, calling to live within our means, you know, $4.1 billion at the time. And then they didn't do that. So then it was four, and then it was 3.9. And we were calling for them to live within their means and to cut and nobody, oh yes, they'd nod. When you get them on the show, they'd nod. Oh yes, we'd like to cut down. We'd live within that. That was a question I asked. Can we live in that $4.1 billion arena? Oh yes. Look at us now, nine years later, five, six, six billion dollars, five and a half billion dollars. We can't live within our means. We, we just, it's impossible. There is no will to make it happen. Final thoughts, Brad. Well, and then from that, the next question is, how are you going to pay for it? If you're not willing to live within your means, if you're not willing to live within traditional revenues, how are you going to pay for the difference? And no taxes is an answer that simply is no taxes on the, what that really means is no taxes on the top 20%, no taxes on non-residents push the entire burden through PFD cuts to middle and lower income Alaska families. That needs to be clear. When somebody says no taxes anymore, what, what that very clear, regardless of how you phrase it, oh, I'm against spending. I'm not going to pay spending until, it, I'm not going to pay taxes until spending's down. Regardless of how you phrase it, if you say no taxes, what you're doing is siding with the top 20% non-residents against middle and lower income Alaska families. Brad Keithley. Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.